in my job, I use mostly C++ and Fortran and occasionally Ada and a little bit of shell scripting and once in a while a tiny bit of like sed and awk, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And something that I've always wondered about since my background is not computer science, it's mechanical engineering and physics and these other things, and I just kind of pretend to do software development. <laughs> we are all pretending. Yes. <laughs> Why do we have all of these programming languages? Why does somebody go off and decide, I'm going to write a new language? Is this kind of like the XKCD comic where they say, like, there's 14 standards. We need one standard to unite them all. And then like a long time later, they're like, we have 15 standards. We need one standard to unite them all. And it just always fails. Or are there specific archetypal goals that people have when they're writing a language, some specific problem or, or group of problems they're trying to solve by creating this new language? Why does this happen? So I think your second guess is the one I would say is the dominating answer to this. The standards argument doesn't really apply because you don't really see an effort to make like backwards compatible or interoperable languages. Like there isn't some language where it's like, oh yeah, you can write code in, I don't know, let's call it Z. There's probably a language named Z, but whatever, no one cares about it. So we write, we make Z and you can write Z code and it's like, garbage collected and thread safe automatically and you can also just write c and c plus plus code in it and it just runs perfectly like people do not make these languages very frequently there are a few and they're backwards compatible because they had to be and usually they're like backwards compatible with c or something they like grew out of it i, I think objective c does that c plus plus does that i can't think of any others there aren't very many languages like that and so for the most part, each language solves some kind of specific need that the programmers had. And then the language is, it's really difficult to do compatibility. Like if you make a syntactic change to any language, then it breaks all the existing source code. So you make a language, you're trying to solve specific problems. Then the language grows out of your control and people use it for all kinds of things in all kinds of domains. And their programs creak under the weight of the language's bad design decisions, but there's no way to fix them. And so then someone says, I know what we need. And then they make a new language. But then everyone says, well, why should I program in that? Because I'm not backwards compatible. I can't just port my code over. And there's a huge cost to porting it over. So then they have to fight really hard for that language to get adoption and mind share. And that's a really big problem. And then once you get people on it, then the same problems occur. I, I think there's some kind of sarcastic quote about this that's like, there's only two kinds of programming languages, ones nobody uses and ones everybody hates. Because if you use it, you're going to see all the problems, but you can't just write a new language that solves all the problems because no one will use it. So what we see is the really slow evolutionary process of trying to make a better language, trying to get people to accept it. It mostly doesn't work and things don't move as fast as you would hope because you have to keep waiting for languages to gain acceptance. And only then, only once they're in widespread usage, do you really truly understand the problems and then you can write the successor. Can you give some examples of recurring types of problems that people are trying to solve by creating a new language? Well, for a long time, one of the biggest arguments was whether a language should manage your memory for you or not. There's no way for a language to truly manage your memory for you. It's a Turing complete undecidable problem whether memory can be garbage collected or not. Because in order to understand if the memory can be garbage collected, you'd have to know everything the program's ever going to do in the future, which is impossible. So some languages do it and some don't. And then people argue about which one is useful for specific domains. C and Fortran do not garbage collect. I don't know what Ada does. Do you have the equivalent of like the new keyword or the delete keyword? I never got into Ada that much. A lot of the work I've done in Ada has been porting Ada to C++. Okay. And at the same time, you were modifying it from 
procedural to object oriented. Okay. And so the old ADA code would not have new and is it delete? I, f I forget what the yeah. corresponding operator is. I haven't programmed any ADA since 2005, I think. So I don't really remember it. Yeah, so that was a big area of contention. And so people kept making new languages, mainly that were garbage collected, and they would get different levels of adoption because people were fleeing from having to manage their own memory. And then a lot of programmers who were really good at managing their own memory were like, I don't see what the problem is with kids these days. I manage my own memory and all my programs are really fast. And people were happily writing Java and Python programs that got stuff done. And then they were dealing with running out of memory later. And it also happened right at the cusp of memory got really, really cheap. And so now machines all have multiple gigs of memory. And, you know, who cares? You can just waste tons of it. It doesn't really matter. The new problem that's really like in vogue to solve is thread safety. And essentially, all computers now are tiny little distributed systems. Like all processors have multiple cores on them that are all trying to communicate with each other. Or alternatively, they're not trying to communicate and all of your program just runs on one core that's really, really hot. For instance, Chrome, a very modern web browser, basically runs that way. It uses one processor a whole lot to render a web page. And obviously that's not really the right approach. It's just that it's not very feasible to use all of the cores given the way that programming works right now because nobody can understand a program that uses all the cores. And so a new language that's shown up to solve this problem is called Rust. And Rust enforces at compile time which thread owns the ability to write to an object. And so it's super awkward to program in because you have to tell the compiler, like, this function owns it now. OK, now this function doesn't own it. I'm releasing this. And now this other function owns it and things like that. And you, you feel like you're having to hold the compiler's hand in order to pass memory around. But it also means that you can't accidentally double write to something. You can't read from something that's dirty. There's this whole class of errors that you simply can't make because the compiler won't let you do it. So it it avoids all of these memory race conditions? Yeah, for the most part. Okay. So that's a really great concept. Probably Rust is implementing it in nearly the worst way, but it's still the best way that anyone has tried so far. And so Rust is seeing adoption because Mozilla is working on this project they initially codenamed Servo, which is to try and write a web browser that uses all the cores at once to render the page and do other things. This is obviously the right way to write a web browser. So we're probably going to see this era where Firefox is faster than Chrome at doing a lot of things. And eventually Chrome is probably going to have to duplicate this somehow. Chrome and its rendering engine Blink is written in, I believe, C++. So I don't know what they're going to do. Port it to Rust? Probably not. <laughs> Try and write thread save C++ code? I don't know. It's going to be hard. So if Rust turns out to be the right thing, probably what we'll start seeing is people making other languages that are like Rust, but more friendly to write in. Like, if you're only using one thread, you don't have to write all of the syntax around sharing and borrowing and stuff. And that's kind of how programming languages march on, but really, really slowly. Hmm. Do you feel like that answers your question? I think that was pretty informative. Because <laughs> I come at all this with just a very basic knowledge, a couple of years of computer science in high school and three hours in college. And then I've just kind of faked it all the way through my career. So a lot of these concepts I'm only passingly familiar with. And the computer science you got in high school was with the worst teacher ever. Oh, <laughs> she was a nice old lady. Uh, Did y'all glue the mouse ball shut? No. Well, actually, that was someone. Someone in my year did that, but it wasn't my class. They did it in my year, too. Actually, I took it in 11th grade from her. Did you take it in 12th? We would have been the same year then. I don't remember. I'll have to think about it. But if you go look online, there's a really good chart of programming language evolution in which ones copied ideas from each other. And you can see that there's a lot of divergence and then good languages get stuff stolen from them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like because of the industry I work in, 
I'll probably just keep working in C++ and Fortran for the rest of my career. I don't see a lot of push in my industry to have everybody adopt new languages. Yeah. And because so many of the people I work with are like me, they're aerodynamicists, they're mathematicians, they have other specialties first, and then they learned how to hack out some code. And yeah. we have a few people who are real computer science majors, who are real software developers, who really know what they're doing in that sense, and probably not enough to have enough force to get us and customers and everyone else on board with everybody going to some new language. There's just too much momentum given our skill sets. Yeah. We're not nimble enough. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other things I feel like I see is you mentioned computer science people who are software developers. I think that there's, there's all these really different fields like computer science isn't really software development, which is not really software engineering. And software engineering almost doesn't exist. There are not very many people in the world who are trying to build repeatable, consistent, strong processes for thinking about how to make software that achieves specific goals. It's mostly ad hoc. And for software development, that's just people who make software, but it, it doesn't need to follow any specific standards or anything. It just needs to sort of work until they're told to stop working on it. And then computer science is this very abstract sort of math based thing where it's like, given a computing machine, <laughs> what could I compute with it? And how many time steps would it take? And how many memory units would it take? And things like that. But not necessarily a lot of consideration for, well, what if you built this machine? So like arguably computer science could have been taught in the early 1800s. And they would have just been like, one day, maybe someone will build a thing that could implement these problems you're solving. So it's kind of divorced from actually building anything. And you can read about what NASA did to build space shuttle software. That was, I would argue, software engineering. And they're like, oh, we, we write all these tests and we have all these meetings and it takes us forever to write a line of code and all this stuff. And I feel like what they're doing is just sort of really entry level to writing really good software for mission critical systems like that, but it's pretty uncommon in the industry. Supposedly people do it for other life and death control systems like nuclear reactors and stuff like that, but I, I kind of question how much process actually goes into it. I don't know. I'm guessing there's a lot of stuff you guys could do to improve your process a lot, and there's just nobody who has the decision-making knowledge, capability, and authority all in one place to do it. 